Thank you for joining me on my journey through Tasmania's 177 nations. In this episode, I'm talking to Carol, and Carol's from Belgium, a country half the size of Tasmania, but with a population of 11 million. It's a nation which has been made up of distinct linguistic and cultural communities since its foundation, and its capital, Brussels, is one of Europe's most cosmopolitan cities. Now, understanding this may partly help to understand some of Carol's perspectives as she talks about her journey from Brussels to Hobart, a journey that includes side trips to Zambia, Spain, the UK, Queensland, and finally Tasmania, where she is now embarking on a new journey of motherhood to a child with Down syndrome. So please sit back, maybe with a Stella Artois or a box of Gillian chocolates, and let's find out together more about Carol's story. I grew up in Brussels, so the, the capital, so I spent all my youth there until... Maybe I was 26 years old, I think, when I okay. came to Australia. So quite a fair bit of time. Yeah. So what 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 kind of place was Brussels to grow up in? Right. Yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. You know, it's really it's really different than here because it's much more populated. So you've got really like, you know, those houses next to each other, etc. But we're lucky to live in a in a in a house having a garden, and I really enjoy growing up there, especially when I became a young adult because there was so many things available. I guess in terms of culture, in terms of I love going to concerts, gigs, etc., and hanging out in bars and drinking beers with your friends. It's really like the social kind of aspect of it that definitely I really enjoyed those those years and had yeah great time there so did you live in more uh, uh, like a city part of Brussels or more suburban it's what you would consider here being a suburb so we may we may have been maybe six seven kilometers away from the city center actually a bit like we here in in West Muna away yeah. from Hobart but it feels much more busy obviously because we don't have the houses like him mainly you've got a little plot of land of whatever 500 or 800 meters square with a house on it it doesn't kind of work like that in Belgium you've got just a lot more population so way busier in terms of traffic and people around and, and I grew up myself in an area in an area that is quite multicultural yeah um, so it's called Anderlecht so people that loves soccer what I call football yeah. we may know that team because it's probably the best performing team in Belgium and yeah I grew up just in in that place where we yeah going to school I was with so many different nationalities a lot different from Europe's but also from North Africa yeah um, especially there's quite a fair bit of immigration from Morocco um, in Belgium so had yeah a lot of friends with different background i was in brussels in the mid 90s and i remember it's a very cosmopolitan mm, city yes. and lots of windy little streets little street yeah there's no straight streets i think in yeah. brussels and very different architecture also i think when you when you walk around the city center you'll have very old buildings that may have been built i don't to be honest maybe i'm gonna say something stupid but maybe around even some remnants of the 12th or 13th century mm-hmm. and then some more modern building and yeah everything kind of maybe you wouldn't think it would work together when you put them next to each other but somehow it does and that's what Brussels is like I wouldn't say it's the most beautiful city in Europe not at all but it, it just has this charm of yeah having all those different building different aspects different people all kind of working together and yeah and, and also if you think of Belgium it's a country where we have three official languages and yeah. with a so half the size of Tasmania to give you an idea with 11 million inhabitants so yeah. that to give a little bit of a context so we we already have those different main culture that makes what belgium is and it's all about learning to grow together and being open to those cultural differences <laughs> So my family is French speakers, so grew up in French. I went to the French speaking schools also. Like you start learning at school usually Flemish, which mm-hmm. is a similar similar to Dutch. So the language yep. that people speak in the Netherlands, that's Belgian from the north part of the country uh, most of the time speak. I've always been terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so it's still, but although last time we came back, we went back to Europe, I kind of surprised myself being able to actually converse a little bit in okay. in Flemish, which I was like, yeah, there's, you know, some word stays in your, in your mind, you, you, you're able to kind of converse a little bit. But if I was one day to go back to Belgium, that would be one of the first things that I will really want to do is being able to to have a better Flemish and being able to converse with. Yeah, because I was going to ask whether people were usually, uh, was, whether it was normal for people to be multilingual or whether they 
people just tend to use their own language or be fluent in their own there? Uh, there's a little bit of everything. I think more and more now in Brussels, there's really people realize the importance of talking different languages and especially the official languages. So if you f- speak uh, French and Flemish, your chance of securing a, a job is obviously much higher because okay. being in Brussels, it's both official languages. Um, so a lot of roles will need you to be able to interact in those two languages. So you, we've got there's a trend at the moment also where uh, French speaker family will try to um, educate the children within the Flemish education so like that they can learn okay. that language and the opposite also and I have to say that uh, Flemish speaking people usually are way better to learn French than the opposite okay. I don't know why <laughs> but maybe they make more that more effort people, more people to speak to perhaps yeah m- maybe and so is language part of people's identity do they identify as being part of a group or is it just a means of communicating with the people around you um, you definitely feel that um, if you, you look at the French speaker and, and the Flemish speakers, there's two different communities. There's mm-hmm. different interests. Um, there's like whether it's in terms of music, um, in terms of um, like we've got quite a, a few good um, exhibition spaces in, in, in Brussels. You have different kind of exhibition that will be put by one community or the other community. When I was there, definitely, um, I think sometimes that it's still lacking of integration in between okay. the, the two culture because i think they still kind of live a little bit separately so if i reflect even to all my friends back home um i will have french speaker friends i would have i have international friends and i've got one friend who is flemish belgian Mm -hmm. but it's quite funny because we met when i we both spent some time in zambia um, okay. working there and that's where we met right. um, so because it's an English speaking country we just started interacting in English and we still speak English together <laughs> so yeah. you know it's just a bit of an example although she, um, she speaks perfect French there's more and more school though that start doing uh, bilingual okay. classes yeah. so especially in Brussels where you can enroll in um, the French speaking systems and you'll have a portion of your class that will be done in the other language which is great okay. because it really yeah and those initiative needs really to to grow more and more because i think if you can speak the other language um, you know when you learn another language it's so much about learning also about the culture of um yeah. the other community but also different ways of thinking yeah um, because sure. Language is organized differently and so yeah so it's i think if you grow that understanding you, you you'll get closer to to the other community, I think, by essence. So it's yeah. it's great to see more and more schools where that are bilingual. I thought that there might be, that might be more the norm than what it is. No, it's still kind of more the exception than the norm. But yeah. many more people, I think, are wanting to enroll their children in those sort of structures. So there's definitely a push for those to become more the, the norm. <laughs> I did an exchange semester going to study in Spain, so I learned Spanish there, which was um, yeah great great time. Pretty in, yeah. Sometimes I wonder why I go to some places um, because you know I decided to do six months study in Spain when I don't speak a word of Spanish, so that was quite interesting, right. you know. Yeah. <laughs> so it was really learning learning from scratch, um, being there and really wondering why did I choose to do this again. Yeah. But Dantian, it's always a great experience and a great adventure. Yeah, well, I mean, it's sometimes it's good to be out of your comfort zone and have to try and navigate that all the problems. That, yeah, that, definitely. It's character building. <laughs> yes. In Belgium, it's quite traditional that you finish the equivalent of grade 12 and yep. then you go to uni or to TAFE or you pursue some education. Reasoning behind, probably because education is way cheaper than what it is here. And there's not many jobs that you'll be able to secure being a young 17, 18, 19 years old. I think there's bigger importance in having a diploma or a master to be able to access some jobs where here I think you can be much more self-made you know if you you can start at the bottom and kind of climb the ladder proving what you're worth which is probably a little bit more difficult in the world of work in Belgium so that's okay. quite different so it's quite normal to go to uni so I studied uni I, I actually finished quite 12 I was 17 so at 17 years old and, and you just choose to go and study something and you like yeah, it was it was a little bit tricky to, to pick yeah. and decide. 
So I did study sociology and anthropology okay. uh, mainly. So I um, think that I've always kind of been interested in in those aspects and people and and all those you know I don't know those I don't know if it's social sciences around it, which was very interesting. But I think what I enjoy the most of my study is being able to go elsewhere yeah. <laughs> and and go to Spain and then then keep on traveling. In, in recruitment and I kind of fell into it back in Belgium. We've got what is called st- student jobs. Um, mm-hmm. So usually July, August or during school holidays, employers have the opportunity to employ students for um, lower pay right or whatever yep. and I ended up getting a month of work for a recruitment agency for which I, I did a month of work then uh, because when I finished studying I was like I'm not ready to work yet I don't really know what I want to do so I accessed a program that is called European Volunteer Service which gives you the opportunity to go and work for a charity or an NGO somewhere in Europe and I've went to uh, Wolverhampton, which is a small Mm -hmm. city near Birmingham in the UK. And I spent 12 months there volunteering and and working for an organization that help women and um, children suffering from domestic violence or homelessness. So I've done that for 12 months and it was a great experience. You know, like it, it was a perfect deal because you were housed, you received a little bit of pocket money that was enough to pay your bills. You were working Monday to Friday, um, expanding your skills, you know, having to work in English also. It's probably worth yeah. one of the first time that I had to, to use English to, to work instead of just traveling, which is obviously using quite a different English. When I arrived back in Belgium, I was like, I'll just get that job. You know, it's um, it can be a bit tricky to find work in Brussels, especially with me not speaking Flemish. And, and I had a great opportunity there to, to get to, to work straight away. So I've, I've worked with them for two years and I stay there because I wanted to access another program that they were offering. Yeah. They um, had a partnership with an NGO that was placing skilled people for a short period of time in different country that what was a bit different is that the ethos behind uh, was more about sharing skills and being able to empower other people and i ended up going to zambia for six yeah, months wow. uh which yeah, that's a very very different culture than than what um i've experienced before and yeah it was an, an amazing experience never been before in in that region um so you know you 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 before you go, you kind of do a bit of research. You know what a culture is more is like. Very, I wouldn't say slow because it can be can has a can have a bad connotation. But it's yeah, it's not at speed as what our culture is. Yeah. Um. So I think one of the first big shock that I had because I, I was living in Livingstone and I was working for a local council that was maybe half an hour away by road from Livingstone. So we had a staff bus um, to get on and go when it was lovely because we were going through a national park. So it was quite often that we were seeing giraffes and wildlife. And sometimes we had to stop because elephants were crossing the road. And <laughs> so you're at work like, sorry, I was late. You know, the elephants were crossing the road. So it's like not the kind of things that you would experience on your way to, to, to Hobart. But talking about that staff bus, um, um, I think I started learning what patience is a little bit yeah. because the staff bus wouldn't leave until everybody is in the bus. It's not because the bus needs to leave at eight that people arrive at eight. So every day I <laughs> spend 20, 30 minutes sitting in that bus at the same place, just waiting for people to arrive before you go. And those are maybe little things, but that's, you know, to show the difference in, of culture. And it wasn't a problem at all. It was just part, it was just normal. Yeah, I, th- I, I realized from talking to a few people just how we're very time focused in mm. Australia and other Western countries and we have appointments and not everywhere, not every, a lot of places don't think in that way. And it's, and, and being somewhere on time isn't, isn't even a concept in a way. You get there You're when right. you get there. <laughs> exactly. You get there when you get there and that's fine. Um, and people will not really wait for you. They will just do other things until you arrive. Um, so that's probably one in terms of cultural differences. And then yeah, Zambia was just was just ic- incredible. For me, it was all the the kindness of mm-hmm. people living there and the different perspective on, on life and the happiness that 
I could feel from mm-hmm. from those people that were somewhere living with nothing. You know, you know the health is diff- It's not as health system is not as good as what it is here. So I met families who lost children or you know lost really close family members quite early on. But th- they were just you know just enjoying day by day and showing really this this happiness and i think that taught me a lot about stepping back you know reflecting and just um, enjoying the moment for what it is right now and enjoying Mm. the now and not just the projection and not just uh, you know we're so driven in achieving things in the doing and that kind of helps me more being in the being yeah. instead of the doing. I enjoy it. It's really, you know, sometimes you need a bit of a reset button and that, that helped me resetting. So coming back, I was like, okay, I had still a bit of savings, so I wanted to go traveling. But I didn't really want to go traveling on my own for a long period of time. I think for me, there's something about sharing the experience with a friend. I find it that much more valuable, um, yeah. and, and I really like that aspect. And I had a really great friend of mine, Claire, who actually told me, uh, actually, I'm going to Australia, mm-hmm. why don't you come? And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I've never thought of Australia, to be honest. I probably want to travel more in in countries that are a little bit more different than, you know, just in more emerging countries. But I was like, you know what, what's important for me is to share this moment with someone and why not mm-hmm. we go to Australia? We'll be glad to travel with you. And and yeah, I packed my back and, and arrived in Australia. So that's how it, it all started. <laughs> how, how, how long ago was that? Um, I arrived in 2013. I had a bit of a shock arriving to Australia, again, being like, why did I decide to come here? Because (laughs) coming back from Zambia and at the end of my stay in Zambia, I traveled on my own uh, around Africa, part of Africa and really experienced I don't know, so, so many feelings and being so much in, out of your comfort zone, etc. And I arrive here and I find it, everything is just so easy. Like, you know, it's just like, well, why did I decide to come to this country? And I was like, okay, let's travel with my friend. We didn't arrive at the same time. So she was a bit ahead okay. of me. So I, I caught up with her after a few, a few weeks and then I kind of settled in a bit of in the rhythm of traveling. And being backpackers, we're not the young 18, 17 years old backpackers. So I think we did a bit of a different kind of adventure because we were not interested in, in getting pissed every every night. <laughs> that was not really why we were coming here. So we did a bit of woofing around and, you know, meet people and stay also with um, locals um, for a few weeks at a time doing different things. Like I remember we went um, in Queensland to like some sort of like pig farm <laughs> mm-hmm. but it's a very small scale kind of organic pig farm and we we're just like yeah just taking care of those piggies and <laughs> learning what a whippersnipper is and taking care okay. of the garden and <laughs> you know <laughs> just like all those sort of adventures and then I met actually the person who is my partner now um, Dougal so he uh, was living in Makai at that stage and we were uh, coach surfing I don't know if you have heard of that yep. um, uh, website um, so we were using couch surfing quite a lot and he was a host and that that's kind of how we met and how it all started it was quite interesting because and it's both of us actually we were not necessarily physically attracted to each other but it was a really really strong attraction Mm -hmm. between us which is always quite quite interesting especially when you talk about it afterwards and so yeah so we were just there for, for a few days um he put on the show for us because mm-hmm. uh, the there was like the rainbow warrior which is a greenpeace boat that was in makaya that stage and we, we had ticket to get in there so we went to do that we went to go to some waterfalls and doing really lovely things and then and then off we went because we were we were traveling and we we kept on going uh, up the coast and um unfortunately my friend claire had to go back to europe uh, much earlier than what we we were thinking and so we we went all the way to Cairns and then um, I farewell her and then I was like okay I need to to figure out what I'm gonna do now and I I, I was like oh, I can probably stay a few days at Dougal to try to you know have a place where I know that I'll be quite comfortable to just think and figure out what I want to do and he was more than happy to welcome me back and then I just never left you know, I, I, I arrived back in Mackay and I was like, okay, maybe what I, I need a bit more time to figure out what I want to do. So what I'll do is that I'll just find a, a job here uh, mm-hmm. to, to get some income while I'm just figuring out what I want to do. And I started working in hospitality for a few months. Then this relationship started and everything felt very, very easy and, and natural, even though it wasn't necessarily easy to leave 
in Mackay, which is definitely not the place that I would I thought I would end up in. It's quite yeah. a regional place in tropical Queensland um, with not much culture or activities and, and other things in, in those lines happening. So it was a bit of a shock. I remember a few months in, I was like coming back from work and I was like, okay, what can we do tonight? Like, let's go somewhere. And then do look at me? It's like, it's Tuesday night. There's nothing. What, what, what do you want to do? You, people <laughs> go to the gym or stay home and watch TV. And I was like, no, <laughs> yeah. this is, I was coming from this so social and bubbly life in, in Brussels to, to that. So it definitely was a bit of a shock. And then also learning being far away from family for an extended period of time. I think you, you I definitely had quite a few days and weeks on and off where I was really homesick. Yeah. It's quite interesting because I didn't really, s- I didn't know what it was at first, probably. I was just like, just not feeling great, just not feeling myself. And then slowly you kind of put things together and be okay. It's actually probably a normal stage of feeling, yeah, yeah not that enthusiastic and feeling a bit of that weight of being, being away from, from family and friends. I think I've always felt at home being with Dougal. I knew that it was that was I wanted. I wanted to re- really create this journey and continue this journey together. I think I really felt home when we moved to to Hobart and to yeah, Tassie. Right. Yeah, I don't think I felt home in Queensland. Yeah. So what what prompted the move to Tassie? Did you was did you come directly from Mackay or was that yeah. Like, yeah. Both we didn't want to stay in Mackay for an extended period of time, so we started a wish list of what he wanted, what I wanted, and just try to find out where can we go in Australia. And Hobart was one of the cities that we like, why not? And so we, we came over for a week holiday in winter to have a feel for it. Because mm-hmm. uh, Dugo came to Tasmania before, but he only went to Loni or North, north of the state, but he didn't, didn't come to Hobart before. And after that week, we were like, yeah, that's the place. Let's make it happen. Yeah. And I was lucky to be able to get a transfer for my, okay. my job. So I secured another role here in, in the office that uh, the company I work for has here. And everything went quite quickly, actually. And so here we are. We just we had a van at that stage. So we packed the van with whatever we wanted to keep. It was maybe not even full, maybe half full. And then we, we just drove down during a week or two, stopping on the way yeah. to see a few friends as you do. And then we started our life here in, in Tassie. And so what's, what swayed you to make the decision? For us, it was really that lifestyle of being close to nature, being in a capital city that has all the infrastructure that you need. Also, for me, it was quite important to stay close to an airport. Uh, being a, well, we see, not really <laughs> much use at this stage, but, you know, thinking of being able to travel, go back, um, see your family, etc. That that was uh, an easy an easy thing. Um, being close to the water also, because you go like surfing. So that, that was the point. So it was really just all that lifestyle and that food and culture, food and drink culture that, that we have here. I think all of that too did us quite well. So yeah, really, really fell home when when we arrived in in Hobart, and we arrived just before winter started, and got into the dark morpho and all that, and you know, it's just like start meeting people, and and we quickly really f- found people and created to created our community here, okay, and I yeah. think the the sense of community that you can have here, and meeting people that have similar interests and. Um, thoughts process of us yeah and that, I think that's what has made also quite a bit of difference since yeah. really have having these friends and that, that that's all community that's all family here we don't yeah. have any family um, like blood really family here so obviously you're all friends and yeah we value them a lot yeah that's a critical thing with settling in any new mm. place is being able to find that kind find that community so did was it relatively easy to sort of make those connections and i don't think we found it very difficult and i have to say that dougal is the most open people person ever like he (laughs) he is he's a magnet to attract people and he's got this really open and positive always attitude so you know we were in makai probably knows 99 percent of the population here we've we've, we were here in hobart for a few months and he knew already so many people I'm, i'm kind of i'm a I'm not as extrovert as he is at all. So mm-hmm. for me, probably, I wouldn't say it took a bit more time, but I'm, I'm probably more picky. I'm probably just, you know, picking a few friends, but going a little bit more deeper in the relationship um, with them. So we've got different probably ways to, to approaching that. But no, I didn't find it difficult. It just takes a bit longer, I think, coming by the fact that 
we're a bit older so mm -hmm. you know you don't go out every night as you do when you yeah. <laughs> when you're in your yeah. early 20s and and create those very very quickly strong friendship it takes a bit more time it takes a bit more work but i didn't find it difficult no. i think if you've got some specific interest and you're meeting people through yeah. hobbies or other sort of activities i think that's kind of helping but obviously it was easy for us because we had good English. We could really interact easily with people. And I can understand if, if you're coming from, you know, different background with maybe less English, that it would be it would be harder to, to get in there, definitely. And you started a family here, is that right? Yes, started a family here. So we had a little Leo that he's almost a year and a half already. Uh, so yes, it has, it has been quite a big journey. Was that part of the plan? Come, you come here and start a family, or did that just happen? No, we knew we wanted to have a family, but before we moved here, we actually Dougal um, very often worked different hours than mine. Okay. Uh, so um, for me and for us, when we decided that we'd like to have a family, I think it was quite important that we could have similar working hours. So that means that we could spend more time together on weekends and evenings, etc. And making a move here to Hobart, actually, yeah, Dougal had some work opportunities coming down the track that were a lot, like where everything kind of aligned. And at that stage, we were like, "Yep, yeah, we're not spring chicken anymore. <laughs> we should, <laughs> we should get going and 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 try to to do that." And so so yeah, so that that was that was quite planned. <laughs> and yeah, Tazi for us seemed to be and Hobart seems to be a great place to to have a family and yeah. and raise a child. So we went up for the adventure. What was your experience? Um, welcoming Leo in this world was a lot of different emotions. Um, so we um, had a surprise diagnosis of um, Leo having Down syndrome, which is called mm -hmm. trisomy 21, when he was born. So you can imagine the feelings that you go through. You know, we everybody just want a healthy and perfect child. And yeah. here we were completely thrown into a journey that we didn't think would happen to us because we we had some testing done during pregnancy or a chance to have a child with trisomy 21 were like one in seven thousand so it's really the kind of things that you like okay boxy sticks that will probably not you know not happen to us and then here we are so that that was such a journey and there's um analogy um about a poem called welcome to holland mm -hmm. um which i think is a good way to talk about it it's like you you're in Europe and you're thinking that you, you you bought a plan to go to Italy because that's where you want to have your holidays and go to all the beautiful cities, etc. But actually you land in Holland and mm -hmm. you're like, what is this place? Like that's not that's not what I signed up for. I didn't want to be in 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 this but then so you discover all the beauty of it and mm. and all the inter interesting things that made this country so so beautiful so you know i think after after the shock and um, acceptance of uh, the, the diagnosis we just embarked in a new in a new journey and i think i became a par a mother but also an advocate for my child the day mm -hmm. the day he was born and he's he's such a, a lovely little human He's very sociable, um, smiling, and he's smart. <laughs> he started signing um, this week, so which is amazing because there's usually there's uh, quite a delay in terms of communication for um, people who have trisomy 21. They will take a bit longer to to talk, and it, I only speak French to Leo when my partner speaks English, so he will be also bilingual. So it will take even longer to start <laughs> talking. So we're using sign language with him okay. um, for him to be able to communicate because he understands. A lot and everything it's all about you know you, you don't realize but how many muscles you have to mobilize just to make a sound or a word etc and that will take a bit longer to get there so he um is he will be able and he's showing us now that by using sign he will be able to communicate his needs to us which is beautiful and mm -hmm. I think what is beautiful also is all the community we've got around us. And when I just think of all our network and our friends and, and connection, how they embrace Leo for who he is. And mm. that has been such so far a wonderful journey. We've got obviously a great team helping us of professional to get him to his full potential. And I think when I gave birth to Leo, my fears were really more about how is he going to be accepted Mm -hmm. and in the community not in our community I didn't really have a lot of fears about that because I know the people that we've got around us and I know that they've got you know great values and even if it can be a bit scary at first being like oh 
I'm confronted with someone that has a disability and, you know, you may be a bit scared because you may, may not be sure what to say, how to act, etc. That's fine. You know, we all learn on, on, mm. the, on that. But it was more about, and, and that's still a concern of me, is like when he will grow a bit older, how is he going to be included in the society and mm. how people, in, will, will they be open? How, how is that going to happen? So there, there's definitely a lot of challenges ahead of us. But I think if every single human being living here could be a little bit more open to um, people with disability, to people who are different than them, whether yeah. because they're coming from another country, because they, they look differently, because they talk differently. Uh, we'll, it will just make this place a better place. I think acceptance in the community is what is needed in, in general, um, you know, and obviously being being the mother of a child with a disability, that's even more a priority for me to <laughs> to advocate for that in the future. Yeah, so that's a different journey than we thought, but such a beautiful one. And yeah, just can't wait for to be able to travel back to Belgium because like no one of my family has oh, met yeah. <laughs> Leo right. yet uh, because we went to lockdown just a couple of months after he was born. So very thankful to have all the technologies that we have at this stage. Yeah. That's um, yeah, at least helping. Um, obviously, it's not substitution, but... <laughs> After being for here for eight years, I have the impression that my cultural differences are kind of melting more together. <laughs> and, I, and I really had to question myself and try to put me back when I first arrived in Australia. Um, and obviously being traveling around and backpacking, etc. I think there was a lot of difference for me in the culture around. Um, I mean, socializing and alcohol for mm -hmm. me was probably one of the biggest uh, difference. Um, obviously, Belgium is very well known for their beers. Uh, not all, not everybody liked them, I know, but <laughs> they're my kind of beers. Um, and for us, when we go out and to a pub and, and, and drink, it's, it's more about the people that you're meeting. When I fell here, that it was maybe, oh, maybe it was also because I was up north in Mackay, but maybe were this culture of just drinking to drink and mm -hmm. um, being drunk. And that's the, the outcome that you want for your nights. Um, when, um, if, I don't say it never happens in Belgium, but the aspect and the, the focus is probably more on these social interactions. Yeah, and I, I like the lifestyle in general. I think here in Australia and in, in Hobart, I feel that it's it's... Um, maybe a bit less the race in a way than mm -hmm. maybe it's also because we don't live in a too busy place I have to say but um, after spending so many years away from Brussels I, I don't think I'll be able to live there again now because I really yeah, right. enjoy the sense of space that we have here um, yeah. around around nature but also the the less traffic and you know not having to do an hour in public transport to get to your to your job yeah. and and all, all those little perks that we have living here so i really enjoy the lifestyle and you know here i've got i'm lucky to have um the capacity to work three days per week and take care of my son the other days where if i was in belgium i think there's you probably need to have a full income to be able to okay. have a house and all that. So I think I'm, I really value that, having um, th th that work-life balance and flexibility, um, which is quite uncommon unless you're very rich in, oh, okay. back in Belgium or you've yeah. got a husband that works, on, that makes a lot of money. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, so I, I, I quite appreciate that. Thank you for listening to another episode of 177 Nations of Tasmania. Don't forget you can also follow us on Spotify, Facebook and Twitter. Just look up 177 Nations of Tasmania. And thank you again for listening.